created this week? Don't know who you created this week. How was I created? Well, um, really making plans for life moving forward. Making plans for life moving forward. Okay, but what other, who else had some hands up? Vicky? There was homecoming week and we had to dress up each day. Homecoming <laughs> week, so you have to dress up each day. All right, that's good. Anyone else? Cammy? I was baking and so I was creating. You were baking, so you were creating. Awesome examples. And I would encourage you to all raise your hand. Because as we discovered last week, we are all creative beings because we have God's image imbued within us. And that characteristic of creativity wakes us up, allows us to connect with our neighbors, and reminds us of how we use our gifts and resources to match God's call. That call on us that, that fulfills the greatest needs of the world using our greatest passions. We live this expression by responding creatively to our resources and seeking God's wisdom along the way. It is to this wisdom of God that we turn today through the way of the prophets and imagination. Thank you, Bob, so much for your children's message. <laughs> yes, spot on. Because of the prophets, these messengers of God, they shared the words of God, both warnings as well as messages of hope. They weren't fortune tellers, but instead, they were servants aware enough of present reality to encounter God's daily, daily encounter with them. And they responded to the present to make way for the future. They responded to the present to make way for the future. This act took imagination these ideas that are coupled with creativity to fuel something new. Sometimes for the prophets, they made a spectacle of themselves to make a point about what was to come. There's an episode of Isaiah walking around naked for three years. There's another explanation of Ezekiel baking bread over human waste. They're kind of wild sometimes. But these visual aids, complement God's message as God wanted to convey. <clears throat> At other times, the prophets recognized God's plan and promise, a far cry from the current reality, and they turned people to, to hope in God. Walter Brueggemann is a sage on the subject of biblical prophets, and he fleshes out many of these ideas of prophetic imagination but in a book by the same name. He says, hope is what community must do because it is God's community invited to be in God's pilgrimage. The Israelites grieve God's grief over the ending in Jerusalem. And so Israel is now invited to hope in God's promise. To me, this translates as trust for and in the next generations. As Jesus ate with his disciples at that last supper, he prepared them for what was to come, and he prayed for their continued commitment that they would follow the way he had laid out. And he promised, you will do even greater things. Imagine that, Jesus saying to you, you will do even greater things than me. The disciples and all followers after will do even greater things, for they and we have Christ's power and creative purpose, guided by the Holy Spirit. When we recognize the present and trust the future, we not only allow God's promises to be made real, we make decisions and encourage all generations to recognize Christ's way of life, to shape that journey. Let me give you a few examples of encouragement and decision making. First, encouragement. What I define as the affirmation expressed when we trust one another comes through conversation, especially 
difficult but generative <coughs> conversation. Such exchanges might include opposing opinions, varied history that molds our perspective, and maybe even different priorities or desired outcomes. But encouragement through conversation designs a space for hope and yearning to exist. Yes, this hope may be absurd, maybe even embarrassing as it flies in the face of what is considered fact. This hope might be subversive to the status quo or what's comfortable. But the language of hope that can be cultivated in encouraged conversation builds up amazement. Walter Bergman says, the language of amazement is against language of despair, just as language of grief is against language of numbness. Let me share for a moment a reflection from our visioning conversation with Eric Strader this weekend. Trust doesn't take time, he said. How many of you have heard that, trust takes time? Eric said, trust doesn't take time. Trust takes courage. And as this courage builds up trust through difficult conversations, being accountable to one another, and caring about one another more than being right, we also build healthy church. A healthy church can be a good steward of what's given it and is fueled by faith to truly live into God's plan for the people in this community and beyond. Doing anything significant requires trust and candor and communication. Creativity can flourish in any one of us. But those blocks, such as lack of trust, or the ones that we can't acknowledge, or ones that we don't even see that are hidden below, can both stifle and surprise us. Such blocks may even strangle us. So I know I've only been here for a hot minute, as they say, in New York. I've only been here about 90 days. So I might not have cultivated enough trust, enough courage for you to talk to, but I believe that we are a body together when we can share how we are experiencing our faith. When we can tell one another how we might contribute, what we are experiencing or visioning for the future, and what God has put on our heart. I pray that if not me, you find someone that you can share that with, for that is the courageous conversation that brings about new things. As much as blocks might stifle creativity and execution, they also block relationship. <coughs> And that's what we're about. That's what we're about here in church and, uh, and who we are with God. And so it's worth moving these obstacles, addressing these obstacles, confronting and eliminating these obstacles, and stepping one foot in front of the other with courage into the creative process that brings life. The next example of holding faith for the future with prophetic imagination comes through decision making. And I ran across a monument sized example of a mechanical clock that is supposed to work for 10,000 years. A foundation called the Long Now Foundation has set up a clock in, in uh, Texas. And it's supposed to run for 10,000 years but also stir up thoughts and conversation about the meaning of time and our specific <coughs> gift as humans to think about long-term thinking. The founder, Alexander Rose, says, we're working in the space of myth and storytelling with our clock. Most systems in place right now are becoming less, less trustful of the future and the next generation. And by definition, the next generation always is going to have more information. They're going to have vastly better ways of making a decision about their present 
than we will about their future. So it's odd that we don't trust them to do that. You look at something like the Bill of Rights, he mentions, which are, is a very short document of principles, all of which are about a sentence and a half. These were created to allow each generation to interpret them into the future. Then take a modern law, say the health care bill. That's 1,200 pages. <laughs> it was designed exactly to eliminate that possibility of interpretation so that nothing would change into the future, but it would stay as it was in its present writing. And I think these, he says, are the kind of mistakes that we make that we should call out. If we're making decisions that reduce the decision-making power of the future, we're probably doing it wrong. So what does this have to do with creativity? What does this have to do with stewardship? When we imagine, like the prophets who spoke of God's promises and way, we are invited to trust the future generations to enliven and support God's promises and way as we engage with, with each other through robust conversation and decision making and continued connection in order to take the next steps with assurance. That first step is to take our critiques of what's wrong presently and respond by doing something better. Take our critiques of what's wrong and respond by doing something better. This weekend, we talked a great deal about the roof, the building, the dreams, and the challenges at Stevensville United Methodist Church and within our bitter valley. <coughs> we named our strengths and who we serve. And as we identified gaps between the boulders in our way, and the vision that we have going forward. I was uplifted, effervescent actually when I got home because the response came clear to me and it was named as this, we don't want Stevensville United Methodist Church to disappear. Amen. From that named value, the leadership team worked in more detail around the ways to address the places of critique or the problems that we identify, including communication, conflict, and trust issues. And we did so learning new tools and committing together to share in doing a better way, doing it all better. Now I have to tell you, as your pastor, this might sound like soft stuff, right? It might not look quite as urgent as leaks coming through the ceiling. But I truly, truly believe that this is the real glue and the foundation that will enable whatever happens overhead us <coughs> to both matter and to thrive. This way of thinking, the critique, to critique a problem by doing better, is the way of St. Francis of Assisi. He reflected on his 14th century world engulfed in war, consumerism, rationality as the sole means of understanding, and a divided world of right and wrong. Sound familiar? <laughs> he did, he decided to do differently. Richard Rohr, a Franciscan priest, reflects on this saint by saying, St. Francis moved from the common economy of merit to the scary and wondrous economy of grace where God does not do any counting, but only gives unreservedly. Once we live into this practice of doing a better way, we're led to generosity-driven hearts, minds, and souls. We give of what we have because as stewards, managers of all that God, all that is God already, we are more whole and connected to God's will. When I married Mac, I also inherited debt. This was the first time I ever had a big chunk of debt, and his school debt felt like a big boulder on my back that I really just wanted to put
push away, but couldn't do it all at once. A month after we got married, we started to take a financial class called Financial Peace University that was led by Dave Ramsey. In this class, we learned common vocabulary. Which of us was a spender? Who was the saver? Who was the nerd about keeping a budget? And who was the dreamer about making sure we go on vacation? And we realized that this class helped reconcile and complement our various roles. <coughs> we found freedom in managing this gift of choice, not because we had the luxury of experimenting with a lot of money, but in fact, just the opposite. We had the necessity of managing well the little we had. The choice came more easily, though, when we didn't stake our worthiness on what was in our bank account, but instead on God caring enough to continually shape us with tools, including money. So we first got clear about a tithe. How many of have you have heard that word tithe before? Many of us. In the Bible, a tithe is 10% of our first fruits. So for me, that means I had 10 spaghetti squash this year, so I'll give one to God and that will be that. <laughs> well, it's not quite that way. Our fruits are a little bit different these days, and more specifically monetary. But just as fruits are understood differently in the 21st century, so should our expectations of money in our society be. Our landlords or mortgage brokers don't care if they pull on our resources more than their allocated 25% of your take-home pay is managed. Neither do phone companies or grocery stores or gas stations. Daycare alone for families can be upwards of 30 to 40% of their take-home pay. So let's be clear. We allocate money to go to the work of God through our local church first. If that's 10% of what we take home and your budget allows you, praise God. If what you set aside first is your best, you are following God's heart. Likewise, due to fixed incomes or life circumstances, your greatest asset might not be spaghetti squash or money, but instead it might be time and energy. A combination of all of this is crucial for ministry to thrive in and through this community of faith. And so as you consider what that looks like for you, recognize that it's your first, your best, that is first to God. Mac and I learned to budget, to assign our money to do jobs, and then to follow through by making sure we spent less than we took in. It's kind of like dieting. Eat less than the calories you consume, right? Well, the church does this well. They carefully name the expenses while also trusting that ministry values will guide decisions first. This is not a money-making enterprise. This is a ministry-making enterprise. So your commitments, your pledge of a tithe given weekly, monthly, or annually allows the finance and stewardship team to more accurately predict and manage the budget as funds allow. Mac and I have considered this question, the way we give our best first, and how we let creativity fuel our generosity. <clears throat> For full transparency, we are able to give $350 a month to this faith community. I don't share this as a comparison stick, but I tell you this because we want to practice our faith alongside you. And we believe that God is working in this place, and we want to be a part of that. If you're here with us, and this is your home that you consider, then imagine how you invest as you would in your own home. If this is a place that is new for you, and you have just said, I want to check it out, then know that you are welcome and that who you are is a gift unto itself, to us and to this community. We pray that however 